Hi, welcome to Perth Show Online from me, Gavin Syme. And from me, Vivian Corrigan. So how are you this week? I'm very good. I'm not too bad at all. Um, we've been out and about quite a lot, actually, over the past week. I know the weather's been absolutely dreadful, but it's Monday afternoon. Um, it's Monday afternoon, and fingers crossed, um, it's been quite warm, dry, and sunny so far today. It's so amazing, let's just, it? let's just hope it keeps for the, for the Rewind Festival at the weekend. Um, we're trying to get out and about as much as we can over the weekends. There's lots of events and things on in Perth over the summer season, so you'll probably noticed that we've actually moved the, um, the airing of the show from a Monday night to a Tuesday, um, a Tuesday evening, or maybe first thing Wednesday, because what we're trying to do is take um, as much of the, um, of the, the film content that we, that we get over the weekend on a Saturday or Sunday and include that in that week's show in order that it's timely and we're, and we're, we're um, maximising the, the filming content that, that we've actually got. So, um, yeah, we're out and about quite That's a lot of the weekend you these days. You were out and about, weren't you? I was, I was a lurking around in um, King Edward Street on Saturday for most of the day. We um, um, h hitched up with uh, Gillian Coyne and Gail from the Perth Ross Council City Management team because they were actually organising a craft market and we picked up with a few people there but we'll come on to that later on in the show. This week interview number two with your, your favourite interviewee, Mr yes, Beaumont. Yes, my world adventurer, Mark Beaumont. We're going to continue the series, so this is interview two. And uh, really we're discussing more about the very first adventure that he um, took part in, um, which was The Man Who Cycled the World. And I've just finished reading the book. Because I, I, I didn't realise, I didn't actually realise that he'd um, that he'd written a couple of books. Yes, yes. So I've I've read the first one. I cried at the end. Did you? I did. I did. Yeah, really? Why? Just because of the. Did you feel well, I knew proud? That, or? Yeah, I think you kind of get swept along on the, on the journey um, of you know the whole thing, the whole experience, and you know he gets there, obviously. Um, but you know it's it's really quite emotional, and um, you know it, it was really good, and I did, I did a shed a tear, and I think I would imagine most people would who read the book. So, um, and then I'm, I'm keeping the second book for my holidays, so I'm going to read that later. Fantastic. So, see how you enjoy this. Well, I'm delighted to still have a world adventurer, Mark Beaumont, in the studio. And we're now going to have part two of our interview with you. Now, we're going to talk about the big expeditions that you've done. Now, I must be honest, when I knew you were coming into the studio, I thought, because I didn't really know much about what you'd been up to, apart from what I'd read in the papers. And so I bought both your books. As you can see, you know, I thought, you know, I'll just read the beginning and the end and flick through the middle. Um, but I've got, really got to be honest, I couldn't put this one down. So I, I, I'm just about to finish the first book. But The Man Who Cycled the World, it was just fascinating. I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm not just saying that because it wasn't so much, Mark, about just cycling the world, but it was very much about the man. And I think that's what I really enjoyed about it because it's a real journey, wasn't it? A personal journey for you. Yeah, well, the book in particular is the story in your words. I mean, when I get a chance to make documentaries, you're filming it and then a TV company make make the documentary out of it. And it's always the smallest part of what happens. They're trying to get a spirit of the journey. But the book is your story, your words, in yeah. every detail. And it is packed with lovely yeah. little incidents and stories that thread take us on this journey around the world. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was a joy to write. I was hugely intimidated when I was asked to, to write that because... I was somebody that struggled to write at university. Mm -hmm. I didn't love it. And um, so when I was approached to write a book, I thought, I can't write a book. Yeah. And it's quite a tomb. I mean, it's quite big. It's a big book. Yeah. You know, I thought they asked for 80 to 100,000 words. I wrote over 200,000 words. Now, they cut it down. Um, maybe, maybe uh, I think they, they said it was going to be like a Lord of the Rings trilogy if I'd uh, <laughs> brought out what I'd written. But I mean, for me, I'd kind of, when I was writing it, I lost track of the fact this yeah. was going to be a public book. For me, it was reliving the journey. It was absolutely the therapy of going through all the highs and lows of that journey, 18,000 miles, and 20 And you started countries. in Paris, just in case anyone yeah. doesn't know the story, right? You started in Paris yeah. and you cycled 18,000 miles and you to finish, obviously, back, back in, in Paris, Paris. And you to pass two specific points that the, the Guinness Book of Records have set. Well, it's t you can hit two antipodal points, two points on the opposite side of the globe. They can be any antipodal points, as long as... 
there's not many in the Southern Hemisphere that match up in the Northern Hemisphere. So I went through Madrid and Spain and Wellington and New Zealand. Yeah, and you've got to have the same bike. Same bike, go in the same direction at all times, never go back on yourself. There's, a, there's some other criteria you need to follow, but it's basically up to you to find the fastest way around the world. Yes. I mean, this is what I was going for, the world record. So with that in mind, I was never stopping. You know, and, and when you set year. off, sorry, the world record was 276 days, yeah. and you did it in... 194. Yeah. But that was my target. I mean, I, I did a lot of research, over a year of prep and planning for this, and I set my target at 195. So I got back, broke the record by 81 days, which is what the... The media made a big thing out of, but for me, I'd, I'd broken my target by eight hours, which yeah. after 18,000 yeah. miles is pretty close. But I mean, for, to come off the back of a journey like that, which is so intense, you know, as, as I mentioned, the 20 countries, the 18,000 miles, the highs and lows of spending half a year on your own on the road, and then to have the opportunity to spend five months writing about that, you go through the same emotions again. You know, you find yourself yeah. back in that place. You're reliving it all, I Yeah, suppose, for yeah. sure. But I was still hugely nervous when that hit the shelves, because I think it's a very personal book. As it is, actually, I was quite surprised, yeah. because you do, you really do feel like you well, I feel, got to know you just yeah. by reading your, your book. Now, just, to, there's a few little um, incidents in the book, but the one that I thought was so lovely was the night before you set off um, in Paris, and you're, you were there with your mum and your sister, Heather, and Mark was vegetarian before he set off. Yeah, and, for, for um, years. Yeah. Your sister gave you a piece of quiche um, and it had a little bit of ham flecked through it. And you, you, you were a bit, you know... Yeah, I was stressed, I was sleep deprived. You I kind was of gave, gave her a bit of a row. <laughs> um, but it's so nice because in the book you say you look back on that incident yeah. and you just feel really... Well, I think by the time I get to Pakistan and I'm eating anything, everything, you know, bowls of the most undistinguishable Well, I thought the chicken feet stew sounded yeah. really delicious. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because when I pedalled out of Paris, the BBC cameras were rolling on me. I was, this was public, the world, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I could barely make it out of Paris because I was so exhausted. This yeah. was the final weeks, months of preparation had left me on the start line with the world ahead of me and I was utterly exhausted. And um, so, 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 yeah, those last few days and little incidents like that yeah. are quite funny to reflect on because I was just finished and that mm -hmm. was daft because I hadn't even started. So it took me a couple of weeks to really get into the routine of riding 100 miles a day, being self-sufficient, being alone on the road, yeah. finding my food, finding water, finding a safe place to put my tent every night. And that was it for half a year. So I did sort of, you know, look back and laugh because the weird and wonderful situations mm -hmm. I soon find myself in as I travelled through places like Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India were, you know, were amazing. Now, thinking about the journey then, um, what would you say was one of your happiest experiences on it? Um, I always reflect on the fact that I had huge worries going to places like Iran. Um, Iran was the big surprise for me. It was the country which was which was most different from what I, I'd expected. I'd heard a lot of scare stories I'd, in my research stage, really being quite quite worried about what I'd find there, I thought, just get through as quick as possible. I find the most developed, interesting, welcoming um, culture and people. Um, quite sort of regional, you know, they, they would keep warning me about their neighbours in, yeah. in, in the way that back home they'd warn me about Iran in, in general, which almost became quite funny uh -huh. because you, you realise that people distrust what they don't know. And, um, and in actual fact, you know, just a, just a wonderful place with a real culture and a great heart. So I loved stories like that. It doesn't matter how fast you're trying to go on a bike, you're seeing the world in a lot of detail. Yeah. I was seeing the world at 100 miles a day. Yeah. On my own for Whereas half a year. In the year. car, going at you know at, at a speed, yeah. you, you would travel that maybe in a couple of hours. Whereas yeah. it would take you a whole day to cycle that. So what about yeah. scariest experiences? What would that be? There was there was a lot to deal with. Mm. I was under. Was um, that big spider in your tent? That you, one. you didn't like that. No, I didn't like that one. <laughs> I was a huntsman. That was in Australia. That's right. And you beat it up, didn't you? You killed it. I was told afterwards that it wasn't dangerous at all. Mm. But when you wake up, you've not even got your contact lens in. No. And this thing the side of a soup plate I is sit sitting on your pillow. <laughs> big hairy tarantula. So, scariest experience? Well, I was under... I was under... I guess I wouldn't use the word scary, but I was I was under a lot of pressure in Pakistan. I was under armed escort, the, the levy, the Pakistani transport police, for about a thousand kilometres. Mm. And they gave me a... 
I guess quite understandably, quite a tough time through there. They were quite intimidating to you, weren't well, they? Well, yeah. I mean, for for somebody that's not been to that part of the world, mm. to to drive along, you know, with a with a pickup with a driver and four or five guards in the back with AKs, AK forty sevens, you know, very intimidating. Yeah. Um, changing guards three or four times a day, locked in police stations for my own security, through the desert, passing by a lot of the Afghan refugee camps within a, mm. within a stone's throw of the Helman province. Uh, you know, that was, that was quite a, quite a tough, tough period and getting through there was a huge relief because I would say that was the one part of the world I was not riding sustainably. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't really be in charge of where I was getting my 6,000 calories of food a day, where I was getting clean water, where I was where I was resting every night. I was completely in the hands of the police. Because you were quite sick a lot of the time, weren't you? Through Pakistan, yeah. Yeah. Just finding the right food. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's the, the reputation, of course, when you're, when you're in places like Pakistan and India. It's tricky anyway, you've got to be careful. I love that food when it's good, but when you're living off the roadside, yeah. whatever you can find, that's, that's, that's going to be tough. And I got water poisoning, food poisoning. These are tough things to get over when you're, when you've got to get back on the bike and, yeah. and ride on. But interestingly, I would say that I got through Pakistan relatively well. It was tough and I thought it would be tough. It was Australia where I psychologically cracked up, mm -hmm. where I, you know, athletes always talk about hitting the wall. That's where I struggled to keep going. And I think the biggest part of that was a false expectation. I told myself for three months on the road, Australia's going to be fast, it's going to be easy, it's going to be good roads, it's going to be good food. It's very westernised. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I got there and for three and a half thousand miles, out of 3,800 miles across, I had a cracking headwind. And that's tough going. That's like yeah. riding a bike uphill for a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's like holding you back. Whereas, had someone had been before you and they'd got the tailwind, hadn't yeah. they? Yeah, it'd like push them on. <laughs> I was in the middle of Australia in the outback and I stopped at this roadhouse and somebody told me how the week before somebody had gone about 300 kilometres right. in a day without hardly turning a pedal, whereas oh, yeah. I was struggling to, to go anywhere. But these experiences, Mark, how does it change you as a person um, when you go through it? I mean, you, you met some amazing people on your journey. Yeah, that's always the thing you might remember yeah. most. Who sticks out as uh, be the person you'll never forget? The welcome I had in Tabriz, which is northwest Iran, when I got uh, water poisoning, I was off the bike for two days, I was taken in, I was looked after by a family there. Uh, the doctor that looked after me there and the family that, that took me in were just amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the friendship of strangers. Um, I would say that that leg of the world, so Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India, I met the most interesting, welcoming people who I quite often couldn't even communicate with because there was no common language, and yet I remember them best for their kindness, for their hospitality. That's, that's, that's always amazing. That's what I love about travel. The unknown around the corner. It doesn't matter how well you plan a, a journey. Yeah. You just don't know who you're going to meet. And, and some of the unknown things were where you're going to sleep at night. Because although you had your tent with you, yeah. sometimes you were in the most luxurious five-star gold-plated yeah, really. accommodation. Other time I was in a ditch. And uh, the next day <laughs> you were in the, well, there was a rat-infested, they called it a hotel. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just a room, wasn't it, with, with no windows, and, and that must have been <laughs> terrible. Yeah, and there was other times in Iran where I was in viaducts under the road, yeah. sleeping in mosques. Um, a lot of the world I was, I was in my tent. That was the most, the most familiar place to, to spend the night. But that's the great thing about a journey like this. Yes, you've got the same target every single day. Can I ride 100 miles? Can I stay on target for the world record? But the regions and the countries are all very, very different. So it's constantly changing and I think that's what people always reflect on the book. It's not really about cycling and I'm never mad about talking mm -hmm. about cycling. It's it's about the human journey and it's yeah. it's it's about the people I met and the cultures and the people and the, and the, and the places. Um, and I, I reckon why that that's why this book's had a far, far wider appeal than the cycling audience alone. I'm, I'm amazed how well it's done. And, I think that's because it's it's not really a cycling book. Yeah, well, I can see I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Absolutely, I could not put it down, and um, I'm looking forward to taking the other one on holiday <laughs> with me because that's going to be my holiday read. Now, it's not just cycling though, because you are a real action man, and uh, you've had more water ex uh, expeditions lately, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, the last um, the last year's been in the oceans. Yeah, and that was a big, that was a conscious decision. I'd I'd cycled around the world. Yeah. I'd been from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego down the Americas and doing all these journeys, I guess 
it occurred to me and stuck with me the fact that, yeah, I've been around the world from top to bottom, but I hadn't really been around the world because I hadn't crossed the oceans. So that was the motivation to learn what it would take to cross the waters by, by manpower, and the most efficient way to do that is, is ocean rowing. So my interest in ocean rowing really started on the back of yeah. finishing the world cycle. And I, I got in touch with a Scottish adventurer, a well-known ocean rower called Levin Brown, and uh, tried to team up with him to row the North Atlantic. That was an expedition I was training for uh, for six months, and we uh, we had to cancel when 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 he when he lost his boat in an accident, which is a bit of deja vu because I've just tried to take on the Atlantic January February this year, and once again we were in a very mm. serious accident where we we lost the boat. That's what I was going to say because not all adventures turn out successful, and you were very lucky to have your life at the end of that one, weren't you? Yeah. It must have really been a, a, a very sort of shaky experience and makes you look at life differently. Did you feel that? Yeah, I mean, there's, I've got no regrets about what we took on and, mm. and how we did it, but what actually happened out there was a horrible accident which, which we were lucky to come back from. We were in a team of six rowing from Tarfea in Morocco to Port St. Charles in Barbados. We were trying to be the first team to get across the Atlantic in, in less than a month, certainly trying to break the 33-day world record. And um, we were just over 2,000 nautical miles across, day 28, and a big wave flipped us, no warning at all. Uh, the boat didn't self-right, so it, st it stayed turtle, stayed capsized, and um, we spent 14 hours in the Atlantic before we, we, we managed to get rescued. And, you know, I'm lucky we had a, we had a well-trained team who, who managed to keep their cool and get ourselves out of there. But whilst I've sadly seen people perish on expeditions, that's the first time I really thought, like, we... We, we really might not make it through this. And when you go through something like that, uh, you know, you do come home and think quite clearly about your motivations to, to, to take on similar journeys. And the oceans are interesting. I mean, um, it's, an, it's an incredible place to test yourself. When you find yourself a thousand miles offshore and you've pulled yourself there through, you know, through the oars, um, it's a unique space that very, very few people in history have ever been. There's about 550 people who have ever rowed an ocean. And um, no regrets for a second. Do I want to be there again? Mm. No, no. I mean, my initial idea was to row the Indian and the Pacific as well, the three great oceans. I think they'd look roughly the same. Big yes. waves, little waves. After taking on all these land-based journeys, mountaineering, cycling, skiing, all the other things I've done, we've talked about how no two days are are the same and there's an interest around every corner. In the oceans there's big waves and little waves mm -hmm. and uh, for me there's not enough to want to go back and try that again. Even if I personally wanted to, I, I don't think I'd put my family through that again. I think that's a good point because with a lot of these um, adventures you, you do think about the people back at home who especially, well we're going to talk about you a bit more personally in our next interview, but your mum especially has yeah, been fantastic, been fantastic yeah. isn't she? And um, we'll pick that theme up in our next interview. So thank you very much for yeah. telling us all about your world adventures. Well, that was really good. You're, you've thoroughly enjoyed doing those interviews, haven't you? I really have enjoyed it. I, I would say very interesting and inspirational, Gavin, um, is how you would describe Mark Beaumont. And it's lovely um, for people like him to give us the time at Perthshire Online TV. Um, you know, take the time out and come and chat to us. And um, he's a local lad. He's from Blair Gowrie. And uh, we've got one or two other really good, hopefully, interviewees coming up over the summer. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's quite a few people around in Perth that are actually quite motivational and inspirational and I think I think at times we've got to be a bit a bit prouder of Perthshire yeah. um, because I think we've got a lot to, to shout about at we times. Do. Well I'm getting my fingers crossed because we're just waiting to hear from a certain well-known um, novelist's uh, publisher and he's going to be in Perth around the start of August and I think we'd really like to do an interview yes. with them, um, but we haven't had the okay or the thumbs up yet from well, this publicist. So. I'm reading, uh, trying to get through 97 of his books so that I can interview <laughs> him. <laughs> I have <laughs> said, I'm certainly not doing the interview and I'm certainly not reading 97 <laughs> books. I have read a couple.
people actually yeah. and I think he, he did something that was on um, TV yes, he did. about he a did. year ago so well, let's just wait and see well. let's see if we get the, the go ahead we'll not get our hopes up however you've been as you said lurking around King Edward Street so what was what was happening I'm lurking around a lot of places we've got <laughs> I'm going to be lurking around Skin Palace grounds at the weekend because we're um, we're out at Rewind okay. so uh, if you if you see us out there over the weekend and you see our person online dot TV film crew t-shirt or something we, we've got a few people out there we're trying to do some vox pops with you the um, the the public the, the audience and we've actually got some passes to um, get into the the guest area as well so what we're hoping to have over the next couple of weeks is some interviews with some of the um, have you got your 80s stars. outfit looked out mind you could just wear what you've got <laughs> <couldn't> you? <laughs> she's always really cheeky to me isn't she listen I've made a special request oh have you if if Palm Leafs are, or if, sorry, if Simon Cowell's house in the X Factor judges um, competition, or part of the competition, uh -huh. if if Sunita can be there with her Palm Leaf outfit on, then I think she needs to have it on for an interview with me at Scoon Palace at Rewind on Saturday. Really? <laughs> anyway, away from Rewind and Sunita, I was looking around um, with my camera on Saturday down at the um, down at King Edward Street in the city centre. It was a really good day, actually, because... Uh, Believe it or not, it rained for a little bit, about 11 o'clock, something like that, but it actually cleared up beforehand and cleared up afterwards, so it was great. As I said, the Perton and Ross um, Council City Management team organised a number of craft, bar a number of markets over the, the course of the year. Not the Perth Farmers Market, but they organised a number of the other markets. And last Saturday, they had about 30 artisans from Perth, Shire and um, surrounding regions who were displaying their products um, as part of a craft fair. So we were there with the camera and we picked up with, um, hooked up with Gillian and our um, Provost Liz Grant was there and a friend, Mr Bullo from um, McEwen's as well, mm. plus a lot of the crafters as well. So, um, let's, so let's see, it's a, it's a good colourful day and a few people to say hello. I'm Gillian Coyne from Perth City Centre Management. Today we're on King Edward Street in Perth running a summer craft market. City Centre Management runs uh, craft markets throughout the year. We run four, um, as well as other markets in the city centre. Uh, today we're showcasing Perthshire artisans, uh, crafts, and we do have other visitors from other parts of Perthshire and Scotland. Hi, my name's Laura. Um, I have a company called Laura's Chocolates. I'm uh, based in Kinross. And I sell loads of handmade chocolates um, and I'm really enjoying myself here at the craft market. Hi, I'm Aline from the Stoke Farm and we're having a great day here at the Perth Craft Market. Hi, I'm Richard with Lady Well Designs. We make Harris Tweed bags and accessories just down the road in Errol. We're here at uh, Perth Craft Market today, having a fantastic time, nipping in and out to avoid the rain, but actually enjoying speaking to people. Hi, my name is Jenny and I watch Scent Gifts for You but also Matte Plus. Um, I do hand painted glass, ceramics and I also do encaustic wax art. Um, we're through here at the Perth Craft Market today and I'm absolutely loving it. Just hope the weather stays. Hi, I'm Agnes. My business is called Web Crafts. I make jewellery, I do decoupage on glass. This is one of my vases. Hi, my name's Michelle and my business is Hearts and Crafts. I love sewing and today I've got all an array of Hearts and Crafts bags, pig bags, carrier bags, hearts on strings, you name it, we've got it. Having a ball. Hi Liz, nice to meet you. I'm the Provost. Oh, you're the Provost. Hi. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Oh, you were born in India. I was, yeah. Well, Gavin, we've had a wonderful afternoon here. I've enjoyed being around all the stalls. I've uh, already marked out some stuff for Christmas presents. And uh, I hope that uh, people who are watching your programme will come down and enjoy the market. There's some wonderful things here and some wonderful foodie smells as well. So um, come on down and enjoy it, wherever you are. Hello, I'm Baptiste Blondeau from the Octopus Band. We are here and very glad to be in Perth for a concert during the Summer Craft Market. We with uh, all my band, uh, which is here with me. We are 10 saxophonists from France, and it was a very nice pleasure to play in person. It was a nice summer with a lovely public. <laughs>
Well, that was lovely, wasn't it? It was really nice and colourful, that piece of filming. That was super. Yeah, it was. Fantastic. And they were, really, they were really good, you know, they were really good characters, a lot of the people yeah. as well. I think you saw that from, from some of the, um, the hellos to camera. It was, it was great. And, lovely. Um, and, you know, it was nice to see the... Um, the, the city centre busy um, mm -hmm. as John was saying on a on a Saturday when it has been kind of changeable weather and it's holiday time and things but certainly something like that seems to drive people down into yeah. the into the city centre and um, hopefully that's beneficial for, for all the, the retailers around around the town centre um, on, 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 a, on an afternoon like that. Very good, that's lovely well as you know we always like to have a sporty theme somewhere in the show and uh, this week is no different is it? We've got something that's been organised by Perth and Kinross Council. Yeah we, we um, hopped along last week to uh, a civic reception which was hosted by our deputy provost Bob Band and that was actually organised by the sports development team and it was really um, recognising and celebrating the impact that football has on a lot of our young people around mm. Perth and Kinross. So they were receiving some certificates from some, from some of the local um, teams and uh, yeah, it was a really good, quite a, quite a vibrant, busy, um, busy uh, sporting sector and, uh, and Bob hosted a, um, a civic reception so um, let's, ca let's catch up with that Approaching the street with, but you don't be glad. 
You don't remember me. I put him in bed, he went up well. And he could remember how fast he was on the wing, or if he was any good as a fuel back or goalkeeper, or whatever it was. You know? So may I offer you a sincere gratitude to the Council for all the work you've done and continue to do for the youth of our community. Uh, it's much appreciated. And we have today uh, our sports development manager and our football development <coughs> officer. And he's going to have a few words to say as well. Derek Keir, the football development officer.
very important sport for the council in particular to be involved in. It's uh, obviously the biggest participation sport in Scotland um, and we feel that we can also have a part to play in making the national game better um, as, we, as we move forward into the, the next qualifying round um, for the major championships. I'm Derek here, the Football Development Officer for Kevin Ross Council. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight uh, to celebrate the, the hard work and the, the achievements of the volunteers at the four community level quality mark clubs in Perth and Ross. Um, I think there's something quite inspiring about all the people in the room next door um, and all the, their achievements and, and all that they continue to offer to young people in Perth and Ross. Hello, I'm Ken Hammond. I'm the president of Wetham Community Sports Club, uh, based in obviously one of the, the biggest housing schemes in Perth. Uh, the club's been going a long time since November 1960, and over the years recently we've become like a mega club with over 20 teams uh, of all different ages, going away down to uh, primary one, which is five year olds. The way to receive this award tonight, which goes along with some others that we won a couple of years ago, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to come and represent the club. Three. William Smith, James Rose Smith. Come to be chairman of the club last season if they've been successful, and their souls are going to be successful in the round. The juniors are going to try to get involved with it all and everything else. And I hope everything under the ladies, they will be good. Everything else goes well for the end of next year. I'm afraid we'll be happy to be successful. It's the joy of the whole band and everything else. Thank you. Well, three. My name is Garth Mingus, I'm Chairman of uh, Bedobin Sports uh, Community Trust up in Aberfeldy. We represent the clubs in Highland Perthshire, the main club Bedobin at its start at the beginning in the early 1880s and we're continuing that tradition today. I'm very grateful to Perth and Kinross for the award that we're receiving today and uh, we're just hoping to continue having a successful uh, time with developing kids. Thank you. Fairways provide cost-effective HR support, from contracts to recruitment, health and safety to training. Fairways, working with you, for you. Visit fairways-uk.com or call Perth 632 561 for a free consultation. I did it Fairways. So that's another week, another show. It sure is. Good, it sure isn't is. it? It's fantastic. Now next week, what's the theme? Next week. Music! Rewind! Yes, yes I really am really excited about it all. <laughs> I am actually, because I'm looking forward to the whole of mine. And, and um, I hope, well, I think next week we're going to have a music theme. Uh huh. Yes, um, we've got some sporty stuff coming on as well. We've got some sport, we have yes. got some sporty stuff, haven't we? Yes. We've got um, Mr. Clark we do. doing Steven some Stinger's of this. Mm -hmm. We're going to have that on next week. And we've got some, we try to do a round up every, about every quarter with some of our local MSPs and MPs as well. So we've, um, we've got a few of them coming into the studio over the next uh, few weeks, few weeks too. Please remember, keep in touch with us. Um, you know you can contact us via email, info at persheronline.co.uk. We've got a growing Facebook page at the moment, and Pershire Online, mm -hmm. and also our Twitter account at Pershire On. So message us on um, and some of those I. Uh, in, in some of those channels and, and we'd love to hear from you. As we say, we're trying to get around as much as we can with our location of filming so uh, that would be great and we'll, we'll try if we're in the area to, to pop across. And it doesn't need to be in, in Perth City Centre. We are trying to get out and about um, in the in the Perth and Kinross area or region, in the big county that's I right. suppose is the, is the right Rain, hail or shine, we'll be there, won't well, we? Well, I don't know whether that's <laughs> quite true, but we try oh, our I'll best. I'll be there. We try our best. <laughs> and please do, do stay if you can um, um, next week because uh, we, ho we hope to be grabbing some of those well-known faces out at, out at the Rewind Festival and you know I'm an 80s kid I might even you might even catch me singing along with some of them as well see you next week <laughs> <laughs>